Ooh. Hey! Wow, that's an applause. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. Hum, fun, the cloud, mum, calls me James, wash away the garbage, leaving rainbows after rains. Well, let's have some fun on linguistic games. Welcome to Wednesday Words, everybody here and everybody out there in, uh, in the virtual world. And um, we got a few poets here tonight. And last night at, on Children's Tuesdays, I did a poem, uh, a dedication to up here, Douglas Stewart, who's up there on, um, well, it's my right, your left. Um, that's, that's him. And um, he was very, very important for Australian literature because um, not only his work for the Bulletin, but also as a publisher and a compiler of literature for Angus and Robertson publishers. Now, in 1971, the University of Queensland Press put out a whole bunch of poets on record, and on, this one here is um, Douglas Stewart, but other titles available were Rodney Hall, Rosemary Dobson, James McCauley, R.D. Fitzgerald, Bruce Dorr, and of course Douglas Stewart and Davy Hope, Bruce Beaver. Um, so yeah, keep your eye out. I think there was about 16 of these produced. So if you if you see any you know, chops or stuff like that, um, pick them up and send them here to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, Poetry Archive and Library for us to look after for eternity and everyone to enjoy. Um, well, let's begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I broadcast the Kamilaroi and the Bandai people to acknowledge the continuing connection to the land of the elders past, present and emerging and ditto right across this uh, continent now called Australia to acknowledge sovereignties never been ceded and a treaty is what is asked for and needed. Um, so, yeah, Douglas Stewart, um, a very important literary figure in Australian literary history. And um, on this Poets on Record, it's a, it's a little 45 um, record, so they couldn't fit the whole poem on the end of it of uh, Rutherford about the, um, the scientist who um, apparently discovered uh, uranium or something like that. Um, so, um, yeah, it's uh, 24 stanzas of eight lines, so it's going to be a bit of a long one, so you'll, you'll have to bear with me. I haven't read it before either, so um, if I stumble, please pick me up. Um, but I'll do my very best. This is Rutherford by Douglas, Douglas Stewart, and um, yeah, his birth date's the same as my dad. So, hi Dad, hi Mum. Mostly too busy to think, too busy thinking. The thinking was doing, it was such satisfaction watching those tiny comets darting and winking. It really left no time for speculation. Thought would go outwards, expansion. His was a shrinking. How to get mind and hand so small, that was the problem. That in one final thrust of concentration, they would be able to move inside an atom. It was the most fascinating thing in the world. And out of it too, like watching some new star, to go in there and watch the atom unfold, its innermost secrets right to the very core, where the star within star, the racing electrons whirled, circling the radiant centre, the white hot nucleus held in your hands, almost as huge as you were, pierced by your thought like a neutron. It was miraculous. How out of steel and glass, coiled wire and lead, the common stuff of the earth, what else could you use? Mere human powers could have conceived and made these 
infinitely delicate instruments to pierce clean through matter to its end, that that was his trade. He had it from anyone, if from anyone, from his father. Then sometimes it seemed alone in the universe. In the laboratory, at night, they worked together. That craftsman's hand still moving inside his own. It was a haunted place, this tower of knowledge, calm with old books, but wild with thoughts unknown. All dark except for lamps, like lights of courage, where lonely scholars sought for truth in stone. It shut the whole world out from man and his work, but while the white stars glittered above the college, a wheel moved somewhere far away in the dark. And huge it was, and turned with a soft roar of air and water, and battered the dark and scattered dewdrops like stars and seemed itself to the core of that clear atom of night whose peace it shattered. Under the mountain towering there once more, it seemed the Rutherford's fate to start things moving, yet how the white snow sparkled, the stream glittered, how tranquilly when his mind moved into the morning. That water wheel of his father's lifted up, water and sunlight with its wooden hands, where the weed grew like hair, then let them drop back to the stream that sang on the sands once it had turned that swamp to flax of rope. Useful to man, the river was free to be river, and on its own wheel of boulders wove its strands of silver light through green Taranaki forever. Such thousands of miles from this great shadowy room where only minutely exploding the alpha particles flashed on the screen like sun motes. But when he had time, when he was quiet like this, alone among miracles, sometimes indeed his mind went wandering home and following his father's, his life seemed queer and fated. For while even now dripping its light like icicles under the mountain, that wheel still turned as he waited. And farmers' drays ran jolting through frost and mud and far by Emerald River and Fernie Hill in long lost Nelson wheels that his father had made. And good wheels too, they were serving people still. They carried the milk, they ground the flour for bread. He too was making a wheel, but not for the water, not for the road or the mill, but such a wheel he knew would carry man and all his future. It was as if in one swift generation he'd bridged the years from the first man to the last, run the whole course of human civilization since some half naked craftsman far in the past, first shaped a wheel and set the thing in motion, all moved on the wheel and the force that drove the wheel, and here in this spinning atom he had unloosed such motion and force as made senses real. Or would, if you could, not control them, but he could, dance then, you little atomies, he would untether two jumps ahead of anyone else in the world, the force that held the universe together. To take man on his journey, go where he would, and truly mastering these forces, he would go far 
exploring into the dark, blind mass of matter, or up to the moon and on from star to star, where it last ended perhaps, or did not end, the trend of all wheels, the high road of human destiny. There was a speculation, but when he scanned, one moment over the quadrangle glittering silently, that splendour whose faintest touch would scorch his hand, planet and comet and star, cluster and nebulae, what he was doing with his finger in that immensity, wheel beyond wheel and world beyond world to infinity. The universe turned and moved about him so vast, full of black space, the huge wheel slowly spinning. He knew he stood with his specks of radiant dust, not at the end of things, but at the beginning. Men would go striding on because they must. But what was he, the famous Lord Rutherford? While there were still such vastitudes for winning, but that old savage with his wheel, good Lord, good Lord. So much they would surpass him, those who came after him. What was he now but that small lump of a boy who made his own miniature wheel to splash in the water? Such ages ago, working all day in the joy of pure bubbling creation, copying his father. Just so it was small and work, just so it sparkled. And yet the truth was that this was a dangerous toy. The lightning swam where those electrons circled. Look at it this way, that face, that way, face the thing squarely. Could some fool in a, in a laboratory, he asked his system, assistants, blow up the world with this? You could pay dearly for probing too deeply into the dark resistance where light lay coiled in stone. He had seen clearly in the flashes of the mind of each atom exploding the next to the end of the world and the light came out of the distance like a wave upon him, towering. They were perplexed. Whether he was joking or not, well, he was joking. There was no need to cower and that was more. And what was more, though sometimes he touched these things with his hands, shaking, he did not propose to. He'd carried the load he bore, which was no light one till his broad shoulders were aching, but need not accept as precaution, think the unthinkable, there was no chain reaction could go so far. The force must die out. The good old world was unsinkable. So let his atoms be used to do man good and nothing but good. Pierce to the cancer cell and as the Curies were doing, bringing him more health, more food, drive the turbine, the dynamo, turn the wheel, blow up a mountain if it got in his road, let him be master of air and ocean and earth, the whole wide world and stars if he liked as well. He had not given his lifetime skill and devotion to bring man harm. And yet this thing was force. And when could you give poor man and his five wits any new force, but he would use it in his wars and blow himself, if not the whole world, to bits. Take off his trapping and naked, hungry and fierce, all over the earth and jungle and civilised city. Men were but savages yet. God help the poor brutes for this new power, appalling to love and pity. 
was force that no savage yet had dreamed of wielding. Dare he release it? Alone in his still room, with those uncanny electrons whirling and shielding the inviolable core, he felt he was living in a dream. And he saw towers falling and skyscrapers melting. Fantastic, inconceivable, yet must be conceived. Then you could turn away, pack up and go home, dismantling the apparatus. And he half believed this moment that he could do it, get hold of a farm, snug, uh, under snowy Egmont beside the river. And there where the frost melted and the morning was warm, strolled down to look at the pigs. There was much in favour of pigs, taken as pigs, life's earthiest form. And those, and in those paddocks there, starry with daisies, golden with dandelions, purple with clover, how rich was the land? He'd have lost his herd of jerseys. And up in the dawn to milk them, hitch up to the car, up the car, off to the factory to yarn with others of his type. Look like a farmer, always a farmer of heart, corpulent, bushy moustached, smoking his pipe, then feed the skim dick to the pigs. It was a part he'd played in dreams, planted on that green shelf with the cows and the oats and the turnips till he grew ripe and simple and stolid as the good black earth itself. Too stolid, perhaps. Well, you could hire labour, a share farmer, say, and still find plenty worth doing. Get on the county council, do good to your neighbour, fix up the roads and bridges, and once you got going, why not keep on? Be Pungaroo's member for Parliament, eh? Minister for Agriculture. Prime Minister then, why not? There was no knowing where he would get into that into in that rustic future. Who now had got to this room and there already, that powerful body that restless mind of his, as soon as he looked forward with his hands steady, were driving him still on just such a journey as this, where he had climbed as high as anybody, and liked it too, although at times it shook him. He had enjoyed so much work, the success, discoveries sparkling like jewels, wherever it took him. I'll dig no more potatoes, so he vowed. That day the telegram came from Cambridge came and dug no more indeed, nor milk nor ploughed, except in the great sense of thought and fame where the surf broke high and white and loud in wonder watched as island after island rose in his mind's eye with their glass dazzling gleam. He stood now Earl Rutherford of Nelson the great seafarer of science. But the room was silent. Space, so it seemed, looked in upon him like eyes, and it seemed possible in that shattering moment that just to be a schoolboy winning a prize, he had ended or nearly ended man's life on this planet. Then no and no and no, he could only assert that it was not true, impossible to disguise, that what he had found could do mankind grave hurt. None graver, true, too, he could never go back and share the old simplicities with his father. Let them live on. But he'd grown to like the life of power, where scientists met together and felt they were priests and rulers. He liked to talk with his great peers, 
that language wrapped in mystery. But he'd be plain if he could. No, it was rather, he liked the thought that what he touched was history. As in truth it was, he'd have his personal pride. A man alive must show what he could do, but that was irrelevant. Nothing. Something outside? The final inner truth, so well he knew, always with that chill in the blood when hands that had died or hands not human at all beyond his seeking, hands not his own like a mist came creeping through, his own at their work and made what he was making. He was so clumsy and blind beyond all patience, but out of the dark from nowhere flashed the conception like force in the atom and filled him with its radiance and steadily, patiently, always in the right direction, despite his stumblings, it moved him in silence until at last what it wanted to do was done. All things, it seemed, moved through time to perfection, through earth and wood and flesh, through the mind of man, but whether it was some quite unknowable powers, dark and divine, or simply the spirit of the race that moved in him and grew those hot, small flowers that bloom behind leave for safety when you could trace. Though you sat here watching and watching all the dark hours, such an imponderable, such an improvable process. It was the solid facts he had to face. Yes, but they gave the same clear answer of progress. And it was not merely the hand upon the wheel that led to this, but the whole drive of the mind, since first that restless radiance tore at its veil, rock, flesh and sky to seek what lay behind. And what did lie, as the Greeks guessed so well, was the whirling atoms. And what was the implication of that? God alone knew. But here, combined, thought and hand had lit our civilization with what it had dreamed of. Not just his own ambition, but all mankind's. Lord knows what power beside came here to some great moment of fruition and into the future class cast its glittering seed. So now in God's name, thinking of nuclear fission and looking out of the window into the dark where the whole world teeming world that the man had made, London, Paris, Berlin, Moscow, New York, how stop mankind destroying it? Easy to say that only science can turn this force to destruction. And science must not, but fiercely through it lay on each man's consciousness there was such soft seduction. In science itself and power and place and pay, you could do evil or fall into taking a bribe. Almost without your knowing and clear of corruption, still you make your consciousness that of the tribe and do its bidding without one trace of guilt, but rather, as he knew well, with a clear of ardour. And when the old passions were roused and blood was spilt and the enemy's hordes came swarming over the border, like Gaul and the Han again, like the Scythian or Celt, civilised men in Europe killing and ravaging. What else could man do but stand against the marauder? That was the thing that must change this pattern of savaging. It was an old habit men had got into, far back in the forest, grasping more for food, 
for more food for the clan and served its purpose in quickening mind and sinew. But now, since it threatened the whole existence of man, we must not, could not, dare not let it continue. And there was the crux, perhaps in that word dare. For never had there been such a weapon since time began. And men who would stop at nothing might stop at fear. But this was the great high tide of power and thought. And not all men were savages. That was certainly that buoyed him up against these winds of doubt. Think of such colleagues as Hahn in Germany. Good God, could he cross the channel and cut his throat? Men had outgrown such horror. He put his trust, despite the whole long course of human barbarity, in what must supplant it, the rule of the strong and just. There would be place enough still for all the old chivalry, while half the world was savage, but now began, now must begin, a clear new turn in history. And there in his atoms, cramped in so small a span, it glittered before him and rayed out away to infinity. How perilous and dark, how enigmatic a course it's, how it seemed to set whirling there for the race of man, now bound to the innermost force of the universe. And yet, as he looked at the sky, so dark with warning, vast over earth and its towers, the night heaved over, close and familiar, as a water wheel turning, and shed its stars like drops of crystal water. And radiant over the world lay the clear morning. Men moved in darkness truly, but also in the sun. And on that huge bright wheel that turned forever, he left his thought, for there was work to be done. Wow, that was epic. Um, actually, really quite, like having read it now, a really well written poem and really quite um, um, important in Australian literary history. So, um, Rutherford, um, yeah, although he was born in um, New Zealand, so was Douglas Stewart. Um, they lived most, he lived most of his life, or Douglas Stewart, in Australia. All right, well, Ashley, would you like to come up now? Because I'm as dry as a, um, I'm dry. Yeah, yeah. What was the first half like? Can you make a couple of comments to the, the first half you read last night? No, that was, uh, that, that was, was the, the whole poem. That was the whole oh, that's the poem. Whole poem. Yeah, no, the rest of it was the, oh, the, that's all right. the rest of the record. Yeah. I remembered when I was a kid. That's a short one. I remembered when I was a kid all the stuff about <laughs> um, the farm and the snow and the river. Mm. But, but I'd lost the binding mm. metaphor of the wheel <laughs> after 50 years. Yeah. Well, I um, am here with uh, mm. a simulacra of rulers tonight. Hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, hypothesis, is if I have them as uh, perhapsnesses or simulacra, mm -hmm. you will be intrigued and you will think, ah, the change of gear. They're not here physically, but we see them boomerang like coming back to Mr. Elvin. And implication of that is that really I like to uh, feel you physically. So here they are. Mm. I fooled you. <laughs> I fooled you. And the test of that is James putting his hands up in a, in a sign. And uh, the parameters of it are that I may appear one day without the simulacra. <laughs> uh, and without without the three rules. But I don't think so because I'm very attached to them like a drowning man. Mm. Well, 
It is interesting, related to our uh, Herr Rutherford, that Plato's forms, as I think I've once said to the microphone, uh, relate to all of this also. He, he would have seen the sun and the planets, which Greek theory postulated in their powerful vision of proof and postulation as a form. And uh, the light of that form, the light of that sun, leads us on to further perception and, and seeing and searing and visioning. Um, thanks for that, James. I found that very interesting tonight, mm. to have that long journey with a very narrow um, uh, hub, 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 mm. however. Well, I have been on a journey. I was at a party, and in the middle of the party I went. So, co, o, mo. Not really. And they all burst out laughing, so that gave me pleasure. And someone walked up and said, you know, if you spell those words with ambiguous um, meaning as core, as an English explanation, oh, poor blimey, or sore as in sore rather than sore, or or O-R yeah. instead of A-W-E, mm. um, you get a completely different meaning. And he laughed at me and he said, reminds me of Sam Beckett. Well, that was interesting. My brother took me for a walk next day up of Maynham and I saw that bridge up past Turumbul Hall. It was just plucked out by William Blake and uh, William Turner, I know, I jest. Plucked out by the flood last year. And, uh, quite a big solid bridge with very heavy logs and, and a holding, concrete holding, just plucked and thrown out on the rocks downstream like a, a thought from nature. Let us think, dearly beloveds, about the flood. Well, I watched, uh, what have I been reading? With my brother, who I was obviously visiting, I watched Elvis last night and um, I would recommend it to all. Uh, Baz Luhrmann's fascinating film. But there seemed to me to be a paradox at the heart of it, of which he was deeply aware. On one hand, he presented showbiz, as Baz Luhrmann does, and Elvis Presley in the, the wheel and web of that showbiz. And on one hand, he says, that is enough in my vision. Yet he also implies that there was a mystic and uh, perhaps divine aspect to Elvis. Or does he? It's a good film and it raises many questions. Um, I thought the ending with the actual screen over of the face as he was dying in I think what must have been his last performance that close-up of the face was like a, an ancient Greek mask, as if it already crossed to eternity. And I thought in relationship to the images throughout the film of the gyrating, orgiastic, uh, pulsating young Italian-American, that it was quite a contrast. So to the poetry, so Baz Luhrmann gives us plenty of that in uh, Elvis. Is it Elvis the movie or just Elvis? I noticed my friends who saw it on the big, big screen always wanted to talk about it. I just saw it on a big TV, but it's very compelling. I could see what he had designed. Um, well, coming up from Grafton and the Nimboida today, I, I had much thought. Coming up from Grafton, I think I could call this. Like a sleep, the rue, over the asphalt, near the wheel on the crest, a splay. The black crows tuckering its gizzards, and flapping, they rise off nonchalant. Coming back after my white sedan shoots past, up, I presume so. Knowing in my own way the hunger nor, naught when my pen stills, and no words catch or come. And uh, I thought of... Yeah.
Oh, I'm by the fire. It's asphalt all the way now. From the Nimboida to um, beautiful Ebor. Ebor and the trip through to Gaira, Ebor and Gaira are divine places. Uh, I wrote this at the table about some observations at Grafton this afternoon. Entering Grafton Post Office, hmm, I see the old colonial timbers. Letters from Germany bemoaning the Transvaal War opened on the outside steps under the arches I leave, now in the 2020s, full of neon and walls of bright that plastic case displays. And the girls in red and white aren't offended when I say, where are the old timbers, the timbers of the old empire, when the Clarence gave up her riches to the bench here? They're too busy and say, oh, oh, they did. That was long ago. Entering minutes, minutes back, I knew uh, I wouldn't see them, but I would. So long, would. Sayonara. Or as the Japanese really say, jamata. Uh, I had a thought for the last couple of weeks which I sent to one of my friends in Europa, um, it is part and parcel of the whole, WHO I think, it is part and parcel of the whole, but also the whole, HO I think. And I thought, is that a pessimistic thought or a realistic thought? And I thought, ah, Taoistly realistic. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for listening to me. I shall uh, invent some more images of Grafton next week. But I'll finish with uh, the thoughts I had as I rose up to evil. Time and tide, we ride and hope, and ridden too. A calm curve of their threadings could await, or last sense to the blackening rocks, our keel shearing. Tide and tide, I and I, sign und Zeit, the shadows, central diphthong, the words share, German and English minds being in time, sign und Zeit, sliding between. Thank you. Oh, I did forget. I must have one short serendipitous moment from 6,000 years of Chinese something. The German linguists always call me and they'd say, you know, time and tide. And I'd say, yes, yes. And they'd say, time and zeit. It's the same thing. So it is. And linguistics is interesting. None of us have enough time to follow it properly. So let's serendipitously see what these 6,000 years bring upon us. No, I don't feel like reading that, so I won't. Mm. Uh. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. It's my tap has gone. No, I, I'll be fair to you, James. Just hold on just a, another couple of seconds. I'll be fair to you. What a smart ass. Uh, here we are. The Testament Edict of Emperor Wen. Shu Qi Shu. Wen Ti Yi Chao. And he, he, he says, this is just a couple of sentences of it. God, they love these testamentary edicts. Love to do them and love to think of the big millions reading them across time and space in a rock wall somewhere or, or on an archway. James seen, has seen much of this, but I haven't, as uh, I've not visited the Central Kingdom. The Testament Edict of Emperor Wen. I have heard that of the countless beings beneath heaven which sprout or are brought to life, there is none which does not have its time of death. For death is a part of the abiding order of heaven and earth and the natural end of all creatures. How then can it be such a sorrowful thing? Yet, in the world today, because all men rejoice in life and hate death, they exhaust their wealth in providing lavish burials for the departed and endanger their health by prolonged mourning. I can in no way approve of such practices, and nor do I approve of uh, depleted uranium being sent in English <laughs> gun barrels to the Ukraine in some yeah. days' time. But uh, I wasn't a child deformed by the impact of DU, depleted uranium, but there are such cripples in the world. Mm.
Yeah, well, um, yeah, death happens. That's in, in a nutshell that one there, isn't it? And the plea for uranium is yeah. what Rutherford did not want. No, not at all. Not no. at all. Exactly, that's what his poem was about, worrying about these idiots. Yeah, yeah. it was very pow powerful mm. poem. It was, yeah, it is. It you is. know, it caused a lot of comment at the time. Oh, it, it was. It was read and discussed, that poem about <clears throat> Rutherford, because it was unusual too. Yeah, well, see, because you, you left a copy of the Australian here last week with, um, and not in front of it, there's a big dip called a submarine, yeah. and, and um, they want to waste 300 and something billion dollars on these things, and they're only temporary until they get some other ones. And it, and it, it just made me, like, looking at that photo of um, um, Anthony Albanese and Joe Biden on the front shaking hands in front of a like a couple of dickheads, um, it inspired me to write. Um, so you'll have to, because I got angry about it, you know? Because, um, and, and, and um, I guess, look, I'm in war colour clothes, so I'm going to say war of words, mate. Two fucking fascist clowns meant to make a war. The weak simp and the puppet arms manufacturers whores. Two imperialist fascist warmongers disguised as socialists Fuck your brown noses sucking each other's dicks, talking up the fear instead of world peace and unity, wasting money on war toys at the expense of the community, sucking the dicks of the makers of expensive submarines, jobs for the boys while Jack swaps his cow for a handful of beans. But giants living at the top of beanstalks can never really relax. It only takes one small man to destroy a giant with a small axe. Very interesting. Mm. Yeah. So excuse my language there, um, but it didn't like yeah, um, upset me. And then um, there was another one which um, I'll, I'll get on to that because I'll, I'll line butts all up next. Um, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, it was the sky. Sky, sky, okay. All right. And, um, and again, um, this one, this one does come with a uh, language and concept warning to, as well. But what's new? It's about war. So, um, mm, warning, language, trigger, concept, political correctness warning as well. And that there's got a very long title and it's called this means war a war of words i want to shove broken glass in the place of your turds um mm. anyway it, that really upset me looking at that paper and in the end i ended up throwing it away um this was after three days so it's like looking at it every time i looked at it i got angry and i had to get rid of it so really here we go. War's low class, war times past, stick arms up, arms makers arts. War's mean, dumb submarines, the planet united as one team. War is over, grow grass and clover. No one should have to run for cover. War is insane, and war is no one's gain except for those who profit from pain. War is balmy, please don't harm me, yells the young boy raped by army. War sucks, lines of armoured trucks, tanks, warship, missiles, and amphibious ducks. Peace of passion, war's old fashioned, hand grenades explode, bombs are flashing. War is grand, let's shake hands, bomb and fuck women and kids, puppet man. War is low class, war's time is classed, past. I'd shove broken glass up these guys' hearts. Yeah, there you, that's my anger coming out. And you don't have to hear me express yeah. anger, but sometimes yeah. anger has a place. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and I'll keep moving around along. Sky, have you got something beautiful for us? Yeah. Maybe, or, yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Sky Canopy, everybody. This one is called No, No, No. No, No. <laughs> um, okay. I see what.
what you do when you don't care to listen, talk over people, thinking you get the gist, then prediction of words, neither, neither pretending to listen, to hasten the conversation, now feeling amiss, then observant of traits of others like yours, absorb, absorb, absorbed in their world, no time for the bored, your time is too precious, you're feeling, you're feeling the gnaw as you think of your next step and put your feet onto the floor, yelling, I'm not interested, as you run out the door. <laughs> um, and just a little silly one. Um, piggledy. Piggledy, piggledy, pock. I wish the spell check would stop correcting my words when I just want to write a sentence that's nonsense and light. With higgledy, piggledy, pock in a frock, jumping around on the spot in a sock. Yay! <laughs> you do the first poem again. Can you do the first poem again? That you short one, the first one. The first Please. one. Please. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, no. I see what you do when you don't care to listen, talk over people, thinking you get the gist, then prediction of words, neither pretending to listen, to hasten the conversation, now feeling amiss, then observant of traits of others like yours, absorbed in their world, no time for the bores, your time is too precious, you're feeling the gnaw as you think of your next step and put your feet to the floor, yelling, I'm not interested, as you run out the door. <laughs> uh, I, think I, I recognize myself in that. At least you can find the door. Not everybody can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know what not interest is. It's a great thing to say sometimes. <laughs> Some people walk into the wall mm. or run in. Yeah. <laughs> so little wisdom. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> First time I didn't. Yeah. Okay. All right. This was Sunday. Sitting on the out the front in the sun. Sunday, the best day of the week to sit and contemplate the next week. Enjoy the sun. Have a swim or a run. Get out and off your ass. Go and join a dance or yoga class. But there's no use in just wishing life is great. To go fishing, plant an idea or a tree or an idea, walk up a hill and then return here. Ride a bike, have a hike, treat yourself to what you like to do today, Sunday, play day, fun day, hay day. That's all. Um, it's sort of like a little whimsical um, Are you ready, Saul? Oh, yeah. I'll just do it. I'll try and put you up again. Alright. That's good, because I, I need to know more about plankton. <laughs> no, I actually, actually want to like, listen to it. I'm interested. I just pinned a button and now I can't find it. <laughs> oh, hello everyone here and out there in the world. Um, here we go. Oh, my number has been pinned to it, hasn't it? Okay, this is just a little sort of... Um, I suppose an everyday sort of a little poem I wrote just as a little folly. Um, goes, uh, Beauty lies in every breath, every breath we breathe. It's in the eyes of your lover. It's in the breeze that blows in the trees. No hopes, no, no hope. 
I hope we find the truth. Life is full of what we do, not what we hope comes true. What does it mean to be happy? What does it mean to be free? What do you want to be happy? What do you want to be free? Life is full of what we do, not what we hope comes true. Yeah. Sounds good. Mm. I'll just have to sort of find this next one. It's pretty easy one to find. I just, just like that last line. Mm. Plain time. Mm. Okay. So this is my sort of take on the current politic of the world and I suppose at the end of the day um, it doesn't sort of matter about the origins of things and all of that sort of stuff. It sort of comes back to what I was just in that last poem about you know, it's not what we hope comes, what we do that really makes a difference in the world, you know, like um, that uh, poem by Douglas Stewart about Rutherford was just really sort of like, you know, when you, when you come across those questions that are fundamental, you know, like um, the Nobel Peace Prize, for instance, you know, like he was just, it, he was a guy who made dynamite you know, for the railways, and it ended up blowing up millions of people <laughs> on his deathbed. <laughs> on his deathbed, that was his thing, you know, because he felt responsible for this sort of progression of man, and from a simple application had come such death and turmoil, and that's sort of the same thing that Rutherford's going through with an even bigger bag. <laughs> You know, and uh, so you know, I suppose it's it's really that thing of getting ourselves together to sort of grow up and get out of that clan v clan sort of idea and become a a global entity. You know, and, and I think that's. Um, the basis of most of sort of, you know, whether global warming sort of, it, hopefully it'll be a polarised, a, 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 a solidarity creating sort of a thing. That like we've never been old enough, in a sense, to wipe ourselves out until 20th century comes along and suddenly we find light in a stone, you know. Mm. Those pretty powerful little words, you know. It's like, oh shit, that's what it is. <laughs> Kaboom, you know. And we've got that now. And you really have to sort of think about it lots. Every single one of us, you know, from our, the people who just don't want to know to all of us who want to know more than we should. We have to just keep talking, keep talking. Keep talking. Anyway, the grim tale of the plankton and the megatrees who thought they ruled the world. If only you were common and I could find you anywhere. But it seems that life's a mystery and that some things are quite rare. I was just looking for my glasses and I obviously forgot them. <laughs> but it's all good. <laughs> but some things are quite rare. Maybe I'm a fool in love with breathing nice clean air and swimming in an ocean without plastic getting in my hand. There is a simple story that we all need to understand that once upon a time the air was full of carbon like the beach is full of sand and that most of life was plankton in the seas and huge mega trees upon the land and that plankton and those mega trees thought that life was grand. They lazed in the sunshine and gobbled up that carbon for breakfast, lunch and tea. And they uh, partied and they partied and they gorged themselves indeed. <laughs> then, one day, day by day, they died. They suffered for their greed. They ate up all that carbon and fell to the bottom of the seas. 
and on the land they had grown and grown through generations past. But they too fell and were buried, a victims of their lust. Because they breathed out oxygen, they changed the air that was so suited to their taste. It was not sustainable, and in a way, they suffocated on their waist. It's like us getting in the sheep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when their reign was over and they were fossilising into coal and oil, all the oxygen that they made lit the fuse for all us critters to embroil ourselves into the lot in which we fall and play and pray and love and politic and toil. Our super clever brain thought up grand ideas and we left the path of nature and things began to spoil. Like necromancers now we raise those ancient dead who thought they ruled the world. We, uh, their rotted corses laced with methane add to the atmospheric greenhouse swirl and we burn their carbon bodies to, change our, to charge our industry and make our engines whirl. Now, today, day by day, we return that carbon back into the world. Good sense is held to ransom for fear that we'll lose the things we think are fun by the soulless governments and energy tycoons who tell us, oh, when it rains, there's no sun. Can't rely on that nonsense. And without our crude and filthy fuel, the world just wouldn't run. But that's a lie, and now's the time. We're looking down the barrel of nature's gun. Every day that we live that lie, that lie becomes the truth. Unlike the plankton and those mega trees, for us there's no excuse. We can't live in poison, coal and oil is the proof. So make every little step you take count, like putting solar panels on the roof. Now is the time to demand and stand, and if we have to fight, and understand that in the end we either die or we unite to make it right. The air we breathe has no borders and the sun is infinite. We'll change. We need to change or the climate will and we can kiss ourselves goodnight. So, if you hear this tale when I'm no longer here and my children's children's children can all breathe clean, fresh air, maybe we, uh, it's the one thing, uh, maybe we will have realised that it's the one thing that we all share and that the world, this globe we live upon, is extraordinary and rare. Yeah. Thank you. And I think on that sort of a thing, all that stuff about sort of coming together and uniting, isn't just about climate change, you know, it's about war, it's about fucking, you know, building submarines that are actually more a figurehead of power than actually going to be any real use. You know, it's about this one-upmanship that we've got going on it really has to sort of start becoming a unity. Anyway, thanks everyone. Yeah, I'm 100% with you there, so and I really like that film too. Yeah. Well, I've only got one left for me. I've actually got two, but I'm not going to do one of them. This is the last one I wrote only, like, this This actually was written um, just pretty much before everyone arrived and I got to sit down. I woke up, I had a little sleep this afternoon and I woke up and I sat on my computer and I put on this sort of, like, Japanese meditation kind of music. Boom. Mm. And this came out. There's a time and place when one must rest, sit and contemplate deep. Nothingness, 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 nothingness. Not move an inch or make a peep. To let go of all attachment to outcome, just the world pains, news and just Meditate in the perfectness of nothingness without all the dramas that the mind creates. Mm. Mm. And yeah, and, and I 
I guess when you look at the, the sort of shortness of that compared to all of the drama that was portrayed in um, Rutherford's head by Douglas Stewart worrying about what was going to happen. And, and yet the irony is, is that the centre of that is surrounded by nothingness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the key to it is the nothingness. Nothingness. He's talking mm. about mm. just different ends of the same yeah. thing. Yeah, he brings that across to you. I felt so, that way too. Thank you for joining us tonight, our, our, our poets who are persistent poets. Yeah, much appreciated. Thank you out there. If you like this, give it a thumbs up and um, subscribe or whatever you want to do there. Um, and um, keep an eye out for events. We've got Fiora Musicale coming up this Friday, uh, Saturday afternoon, the Almodar Chamber Choir with J.S. Parks. Um, St John's Passion and next weekend we've got on Saturday night the uh, Fool's Bush Dance with the Big Hairy Bush Dance Band and Saw on the, um, on the, on the Baby Rattle. <laughs> the, the Baby Rattle. <laughs> um, the the, the Lagophone, that's the one. I can, I can never remember it. Yeah. <laughs> The what? It is a very, it's a great hall for dancing, yeah. So, um, yeah, look it, look it up. You can find the details on our website or on the uh, Facebook page. All right, have a lovely evening and we'll catch you next week for Wednesday. Well,